Hi, this is Jeff Heaton. You know, when you're using Keras, you always specify these activation functions and loss functions. You can define your own, and there's times that you'll want to do this. Activation functions, this might be if you're implementing an algorithm from a paper, and the activation function being specified in that paper is very new and not yet supported by TensorFlow. However, the more common case is the loss function, where you want to really fine tune what the optimizer is setting your weights towards so that it's solving truly the exact problem that you are encountering. You might want to weight certain cases higher than others as it's looking through your training set. Kaggle also is known to sometimes throw in very obscure loss functions or custom loss functions that are used to evaluate you when they determine your score. And to align the loss function to that can be very advantageous. What's just as interesting about creating a custom loss function or activation function in Keras is how it is actually done. Normally you have to come up with a derivative, the calculus derivative, the gradient of the loss function or activation function that you're doing. However, TensorFlow has a very innovative way to take care of this automatically for you, so long as you know what's going on. For the latest on my AI course and projects, click subscribe and the bell next to it to be notified of every new video. Activation functions and loss functions both have to plug into the backpropagation algorithm, which works largely by looking at the gradients, the derivatives of the loss function and everything that feeds into it, and optimizing the weights of the neural network by taking the partial derivative of each weight. So let's look at how we used to do this, and this will let you see why the way that TensorFlow does this is so very cool. One thing that I used to work on is a project called NCOG. It was basically a Java and C Sharp neural network and some other machine learning frameworks as well, jar file for, jar and DLL file for Windows. NCOG was basically a Java and also a C Sharp machine learning framework that I developed Back before TensorFlow, really I started doing this in 2008 when deep learning was pretty new and neural networks were not as widely supported. Let me show you how I set this up and how most of the frameworks of this time period set it up. And then you can see why it's so cool the way that TensorFlow does this. Now activation functions and loss functions, you've got to have a way to take the derivative of those. And if we look at the Java source code for NCOG, some of my longer term subscribers will remember NCOG. And we'll look at the sigmoid activation function. The way I did this was basically by passing in a vector of values, and you would calculate, essentially, the activation function on that vector. But then any activation function that you would create to extend NCOG, you would have to basically define one of these classes, implement the activation function interface, and then you'd provide activation function, which is the actual activation function itself, and then the derivative. And the derivative was passed in here also by passing in the vector. In TensorFlow, when you define one of these, you don't have to take the derivative yourself. TensorFlow has a really cool way of taking the derivatives automatically. And we'll see how that works. It's, under, it's important to understand how that works because sometimes it doesn't. And if you know how TensorFlow is taking those automatic derivatives, you're able to understand that and construct your activation and loss functions so that it works well with whatever trainer you want to use it with. So I'll give a link to this notebook up on the description that is below this video. First, let's look at how you calculate things in TensorFlow. And this is very much TensorFlow 2.0 because this changed a decent amount up to 2.0. So this is the current stuff. If you try to run this on earlier versions of TensorFlow, you'll run into problems. This is how you do calculation in TensorFlow. TensorFlow is fundamentally a linear algebra package, and it provides some very useful capabilities for that. First, let's do something really simple. We are going to multiply 2 by 5. Notice these are TensorFlow constants. A TensorFlow constant is really just a numeric value that is not going to change. A variable is something like a weight that will be changed as you potentially optimize things. So go ahead and run that. It takes it a moment to import TensorFlow. And you'll see that I get a tensor back. It is a single number. You always want to look at the numpy. That is what it gave you back. So it's 2 times 5 is 10. If you want just the numpy number, then put that function in there. 
put that. If you want just the numpy number, then put the numpy function at the very end and you get just a simple number returned. We can also do multiplies. Now I'm doing the multiply a little bit differently here. I am multiplying two vectors and we're passing in numpy vectors, just showing that you can put numpy directly in. So a vector of 2, 4 times 2, 4 is 4 and 16 vector. You can also just pass in numbers. You have to be a little careful with this one though, because notice this is int32. That will often get you into trouble. Usually you want everything to be in floating point or you'll get other various errors that are not always obvious. Divide similar. Here I'm doing an integer division. Not everything, while well, I passed in integers, a floating point comes back. Not everything supports integers as we'll see in TensorFlow. You can also do exponents, quite a few things. There are trig functions, all sorts of things built into it. Now I'm using tf.math there. You, it's really kind of the older form of that. Usually you just want to do tf.pow. You don't really need to do tf.math. They were all sort of moved into the main, the main package. You can also do more complicated things. So this is a more complicated expression. This is actually the logistic and it calculates it out 0 0.99. So this is very functional. Essentially, we are taking the negative of x, then raising that to the power of e, then adding one to it, and then taking the reciprocal essentially, one divided by that whole thing. So this is how you calculate values in TensorFlow. And this is how you'll write your activation functions. And there's a whole host of functions available. You can do if statements, you can do a variety of things, even loops and other things. So now that we see how to calculate with this, this is what you will use to actually build your activation and loss functions. Let's see how we can do some basic calculus on this. So how do we take derivatives? There's really three primary ways. There is symbolic differentiation. This is what you probably learned when you took your first calculus class, all these neat things where they give you these tables of the derivative of a constant is zero, the derivative of, this is an important one, this is one that we will use as, an, as a real simple example. The derivative of x to the power of n is equal to n put in the front is a coefficient and then the power minus one. So x to the power of two would become just x if you took the derivative of it. This is called the power rule and we will use this in as a simple example of how to take the derivative of something, and then we'll get a lot more complicated. There is numeric differentiation. This is often used to double check things in machine learning. That's what I primarily used it for. It is an algorithm whereby you essentially calculate, this is fundamentally it here, you take the function and you essentially take the function at a location, x, and plus h, subtract those, so see the difference between those, divide it by h, and then you take the limit of that as h approaches zero. Obviously you can't take it at zero because that would be division by zero. So this is a great way to estimate a derivative. And this is used sometimes just as a double check. If you look at NCOG, what I showed you earlier, when I took those derivatives of various things by hand, I would use symbolic differentiation to, to do that. And usually I would have to do a bit of code. So most of those older neural networks, they would use chain rule over and over and over again. You would put the chain rule into a loop and derive some of these by, or differentiate some of these by hand. And then you would use numeric differentiation just to check to see that your code is really doing that symbolic differentiation correctly. Now symbolic differentiation is really a pain in the neck to write computer programs that can actually do that. There are packages available for Python that will do that and we'll probably go through one of those in a future video. I'll probably do a video where I talk about all three of these and just how you literally take these derivatives in different ways. The problem though with the numeric differentiation, the finite difference like we just saw, is it's, it's inaccurate and you don't get a really good result. You get a good estimate of your derivative, but it's, it's not anything you'd probably want to use for really, really precise machine learning. That being said, I have used it in that capability before, or that capacity before, and it works okay. Uh, but, for, but for anything real, you'll probably want to do either by hand symbolic or automatic differentiation. And automatic is what TensorFlow uses. This essentially just keeps a log of Wikipedia has a pretty good description of it. Basically what it's doing is it's keeping a log of every calculation that you do in your function 
and then using the chain rule to sort of unwind that because it realizes that just about any function is going to break down to addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and it can simply chain rule those. And it even has other functions like the trig functions. I won't get into exactly how that works, but it does work very, very well. So let's look at this. We're going to take the derivative of x squared. That's a very easy one. Symbolic derivative, that is the rule that I just showed you. If you want to take this for a specific number, like say 4, 4 to the power of 2 is 16. If we take the derivative of that, it's just going to be 2 times 4, or 8. So that's taking the derivative at a single point. This shows how you would do it actually in code. So we're going to take that same number, 4. This is where we use the gradient tape. And this is how we log all these calculations as we're going through this and allow ourselves to actually take the derivative. You always have to tell it what you're watching. This is what you're taking the derivative with respect to. So this is going to be used to take the derivative with respect to x. Now you can watch multiple ones. You just call it multiple times. And when you're coding your activation function later on, you don't actually put the watch in here or even this. This is all done in the background. So I'm just showing you how TensorFlow actually takes a derivative in the background so that you can understand when it goes awry how to, how to fix that. Because you might use something accidentally that's non-differentiable and then you have a problem. I don't really need this reduce sum. I put that in there. Mainly the example that I pulled this from had that in there. But this is, if, if I put something that was not a constant in here, then it would, it would basically reduce it to a sum. So if I put a vector or a tensor in there, then that would, uh, that would handle that. It would still be a constant, but it would be a constant tensor. And then we just multiply y by y. So I'll actually remove that part since it's, it's not necessary for this example. Then to take the, the derivative, we want to take the derivative of z with respect to x. We just call gradient and we can print that out. Now if we run this, there it shows you basically the output. It's a tensor of 8, which matches what I did by hand. It's always good when you can match what you did by hand. So now let's try to do a much more complicated function, or not tremendously more complicated, but we'll do the logistic function. This is essentially the sigmoid activation function that you see in neural networks. And this is what it looks like. It's basically just the reciprocal of 1 plus e to the power of negative x. Here, I essentially write it in TensorFlow. So notice the divide. You always take the, sort of the last thing that you would have to do in this whole thing is the divide. So the last thing you do comes first. Then you, the one there, that's the one up there. I'm going to add one, one plus exp e to the power of negative x. So this is writing it all functional so that it fits into TensorFlow. And then we do exactly the same as before. We're doing it with respect to x, and I'm passing in 5. So I run this, and I print out essentially two things. I print out y so that you can see what the logistic is actually calculating it as. So 0 0.99 is the result from the logistic. And then the derivative is 0 0.0066 when taken at the 5 that we pass in. So let's check this. Let's make sure that this is actually right. So I am going to run this. This is just this written in Python. And it calculates it. It gets that same 0 0.99. Now let's take the derivative of this, symbolic. I could step you through how to do that, but I like to use Wolfram. If you haven't looked at Wolfram, this is great. It'll take the derivative of just about anything. You get rid of the math in front of that because that is Python. And now it can. it's already calculating it. But I'm going to put an x in for there. And now we take the derivative of that. And we scroll down to where the derivative is, which is right here, e to the power of x, negative e to the power of x over x squared plus 1, and that whole thing squared. We can take that, put that into here, and calculate it as well. Now, I did when I did this actually on my own, I was pausing for a second there to see where my negative went, but I'm basically putting the negative there. So that shows you essentially how to, and then we write essentially the same thing. The negatives are a little bit different locations than mine, but it, it comes out to the same. And we run that and you see the result there. You can also use this to say take second derivatives and beyond. So you just nest it to take additional higher order derivatives. Now let's look at this and see how to create a custom loss function. Here I am essentially giving you the root mean square loss function. So it's essentially mean square error 
with a square root at the very top of it. TensorFlow does not provide this for you because it's kind of pointless to provide it for you because it's just mean square error, which it does provide with the square root taken. And here you can see I've basically taken the root mean square function. And let me just give you the root mean square error. So it's essentially taking the square root of the sum of these squares divided by t, which is how many, how many numbers are actually there. It's somewhat like an average. Somewhat like showing you your average error uh, without the sign, because the squares eliminate the signs. So I'll go ahead and define it here. If you want to, I'm not going to walk you through every single one of these. Uh, the thing, the only thing that happened with this that caused me a little bit of uh, trouble implementing is I do have to cast this. So this is the this is t, essentially. This is the size of the sample. That comes back as an integer. And that throws all kinds of havoc into here. So I convert it to a floating point. Always be aware of that when you're creating these. So I'm going to run it to find my function. Now, the I called it mean prediction. So basically, copy that there. And you'll put it in as your loss function. And this is an example from my class, basically the auto miles per gallon regression, a fairly simple neural network. We'll run it. and it, it trains. Now what you're seeing for loss now is root mean square error. So this is, it trains to the point that we're correct by about plus or minus 3.7 miles per gallon. This is showing you just how to create your own loss function. And if you wanted to get a lot more customized on what you're optimizing to, this is a very useful technique. I use this actually frequently with, with neural networks. I don't use this one ever really. If you did truly want to create your own activation function, you could. I chose an activation function that TensorFlow does not have, the Elliott activation function. It's a pretty old one. I don't think it's got too much modern use in the days of ReLU, but just to show you something that was not there. This is meant to be a computationally efficient, meaning it doesn't use e to the power of x, representation of the sigmoid or the tangent, the hyperbolic tangent activation functions that used to be really, really popular. So I implement it here, and we run it. And to put it in, I'm basically putting it in here and here, just where I would put in the rectified linear unit. It does not perform as well as the rectified linear unit. It does decrease and gets to gets stuck right about in the 60s. Maybe further optimization would allow me to get this activation function type to work with it, but this is really just showing you the motions that you go through if you wanted to create your own activation function. Like if you read about a new one in a paper and it's not supported in TensorFlow and you wanted to add it, or if you're really going at it and wanted to truly create your own activation function and then write a paper about it. This is the steps that you would go through. Of these two technologies, I think you'll definitely make use of the loss function customization more. This can be very useful in Kaggle where you've got a very specific evaluation function that you want to align your objective function to. This can squeeze out a couple of additional points, which means all the difference in Kaggle. Also, this can really let you fine tune your objective to the actual business problem that you're trying to solve. You can weight different things differently. You can really fine tune how this optimization is actually going for the given problem. Thank you for watching this video and don't forget to subscribe.